It was a randomized placebo-controlled trial, and the results were outstanding. We actually had an improvement in progression-free survival to more than 18 months, an absolute improvement overall of approximately 50 percent, and a highly significant p-value. The presenter, Dr. Bastelga, mentioned the fact that, in fact, in first-line HER2-positive breast cancer, as well as any first-line metastatic setting, never result that outstanding. Uh, what the trial demonstrated was that there was an increased uh, response rate in patients who got all three drugs, meaning pertuzumab, trastuzumab, and docetaxel. And most importantly, it, it uh, translated into an improvement in the progression-free survival of six months. And six months is clearly something that's an added benefit to patients. I think one of the uh, most important lessons that comes from the Cleopatra study is a dual targeting of the pathway is more effective than using a single agent. And we've seen this even prior to Cleopatra because uh, looking at the combination of lapatinib plus trastuzumab in patients who already progressed on trastuzumab, we found that that was more effective than monotherapy. So this notion that coming at the uh, pathway with either two antibodies or an antibody and a tyrosine kinase inhibitor I think is uh, logical, it's based on good scientific um, rationale, and it's panning out in the clinic. So I think we're going to see more strategies like that, whether it's HER2 or some other pathway, to really come at it with more than one agent. Uh, pertuzumab was also very well tolerated. We see a number of targeted agents that cause significant toxicity. Pertuzumab really doesn't. Uh, there wasn't, there were a few increased toxicities when you gave pertuzumab, but patients were treated for a longer duration. So it's a little hard to separate out what those uh, toxicities were caused by, and they were quite modest. In addition, there wasn't an increase in cardiac toxicity as well. As we've seen with the other monoclonal antibodies, the addition of a second here, pertuzumab, did not add greatly to the toxicity. It's interesting to me when we start talking about fatigue as a toxicity, which can be relevant, it means that we're not talking about alopecia, not talking about neuropathy, not talking about some of the other toxicities that are more difficult for patients to manage. This population of patients actually was fairly atypical uh, com compared to the patients we see now most frequently in the metastatic setting. Only 10% had received prior trastuzumab. And many of the patients actually were hormone therapy naive as well, which again, it's quite curious that the patient population was so uh, treatment naive relatively. Uh, in any case, they received docetaxel and trastuzumab or docetaxel, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab, another antibody that blocks heterodimerization of HER2 to other HER receptors probably most importantly HER3. There were archived tumor tissues uh, collected in these patients and we're hopeful that we may get some idea about which patients were most likely to respond to the combination with pertuzumab because the sad fact is that although this is a tremendous advance and will set a new standard of care in HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, one, the patient population is very uh, much a trastuzumab naive group, so atypical, uh, and there were very few complete responses. So we're still not achieving our long-term goal of creating a chronic disease out of metastatic breast cancer. So the other issue, of course, is now that we have perhaps coming very soon a new drug for the treatment of HER2 positive breast cancer, how will it fit in? And I suspect based on these data, there's a good chance that this drug will be approved. And obviously where it's likely to be approved is in combination with trastuzumab and chemotherapy as first line treatment for metastatic disease. So of course it begs the question, what will you do when patients progress? Uh, and obviously the other drug that we currently have available is lapatinib, uh, which is an oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor blocking HER1 and HER2. But interestingly, we have a number of other drugs that are in development uh, fairly far along, and those include TDM1, which is another antibody, and that antibody is a cytotoxic combined with trastuzumab. So we may find that that's a good drug to use after disease progression on trastuzumab, perhaps plus pertuzumab. Uh, additionally, we have some small molecules that are also fairly far in development, including afitinib and neratinib, which are, again, both small oral um, compounds uh, that hopefully will find their way into uh, the clinic uh, relatively soon. So those are all drugs that are in clinical trial, fairly far in development, and what it really represents is probably 
that many more options that we have available for patients with HER2 positive disease. Uh, I think the excitement around this drug has been manifested by the fact that the adjuvant trials are starting. And so that's the goal. Anytime we get these therapies approved in relapse or metastatic disease, to see them quickly moving into the adjuvant setting where we can begin to possibly talk about curing patients, that's a really remarkable achievement. I think to the credit of the sponsor, Genentech also announced at the time of the presentation was that the filing had already begun with the FDA. So hopefully these will be therapies that will be coming to our community oncologists much sooner than later.